Welcome to Lesson 7, Redox Processes. Lesson 6, we learned about voltaic galvanic cells. And Lesson 7, we're going to learn about electrolytic cells. From last time, recall that a voltaic cell will always run in the direction that gives a positive standard potential difference of a cell. So remember that means that it's always going to be a spontaneous reaction. We see that as we look at the reactivity series, when we go up the reactivity series, it increases the strength of the reducing agent, which is the one being oxidized. So it's more easily oxidized as we go up and it increases in strength of reducing. Um, so strength of oxidizing agents. So when you go down, it gets easily reduced. So as you go down the reactivity series, more easily reduced, increasing um, oxidation as you go up. Today we're going to look at 9.2 and 19.1 again, but this time at electrolytic cells and not voltaic. And we'll do a few comparisons. Remember from this previous slide, um, last lesson, we learned that voltaic galvanic cells, as you see down there, um, generate electricity from chemical reactions. Electrolytic cells generate chemical reactions from electrical energy. So you provide electrical energy in order to generate a redox reaction. And that's what we're going to look at today. Previously, in a voltaic cell, takes energy of spontaneous redox reaction. So the redox reaction in itself is spontaneous. And because it's spontaneous, we can easily generate electrical energy from that. Uh, voltaic cells are usually exothermic, and so we can take the form of the heat and utilize, instead of um, heat, we can generate electrical energy. Now, for electrolytic cells, it takes external source of electrical energy to generate a redox reaction. This means that the redox reaction doesn't come spontaneously, right? So because it co doesn't come spontaneously, you need to provide an external source of electricity in order for the chemical reaction to run. Some uses of electrolytic cells. You might have frozen food in your freezer. Um, for you, frozen fruit, frozen veggies, um, that's an example of electrolytic cells. Um, and that's because we are able to separate um, specific molten salts into their elemental forms. And those elemental forms can be reused to make um, freezing produce products. Um, those elemental forms could be in the production of plastic. It could also be in the production of electroplating, as you see with all the different types of screws. Electrolytic cells, they are typically very reactive, and so because of that, you really can't find any reducing agents available. So because there aren't really any reducing agents available, um, these compounds such as aluminum, lithium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium found naturally in compounds like sodium chloride and aluminum oxide, they're really hard to separate. And because they don't happen spontaneously, we have to supply an external source of electrical energy in order to bring about a redox reaction. Recall from previously in the voltaic cell, remember how we looked at zinc and copper electrodes? Zinc being at the anode um, where the electrode is negative. Copper has a more positive electrode potential and it's at the cathode. We see that the electrons flow from anode to cathode and we're able to generate um, electrical energy through measuring it with a voltmeter to see how much energy we can actually generate. We also see that these two separate electrodes are submerged in their own solution of its ions um, in their own beakers. So zinc is in a zinc sulfate beaker, copper is in its copper sulfate beaker. Now electrolytic cells. 
Do you guys notice the difference immediately and that, first of all, we don't have a voltmeter anymore. So the top is now replaced by a DC supply of electricity. We also see that the electrodes are not separated into two separate beakers. So it's not like before where um, zinc is in the zinc beaker and the copper is in the copper beaker. So now they're both in one beaker and the beaker contains the molten salt that we want to separate into its elemental forms. The two metals, um, they're not different. They can just be the same metal um, or it could just be graphite. And the two metal electrodes, um, one is going to be a positive electrode and one is going to be a negative electrode. So the positive ele electrode we see now is on the anode side. So remember the voltaic cell, um, the anode contained the negative electrode with zinc last time. Um, this time in electrolytic, it's swapped. So the anode is positive electrode now and the cathode is negative electrode now. We see that the anions flow towards the anode in the electrolytic cells. So the an to the an and the cat to the cat, the cations flowing to the cathode. The cations flowing to the cathode because the cations are positive ions, so they flow towards the negative electrode. The anions are negative ions, so they flow towards the positive electrode. An to an, cat to cat. We see that the anode and the cathode, the two equations below with the A anion and the M cation, we see that anode is still being oxidized and the cathode is still reduction. So that doesn't change. Um, that's one thing that stays the same. Anode and cathode, electrons always flow from anode to cathode. That doesn't change, number one. Number two, anode is always oxidation and cathode is always reduction. So that doesn't change between electrolytic and voltaic cells either. Um, ions in the electrolyte, then the electrolyte is the blue. So electrolyte is the blue molten salts. So the electrolyte migrate to electrodes of opposite charges. And as the anions flow towards the anode and the cations to the cathode, um, that helps carry the full circuit of electron flow from the circuit that's supplied into the electrolyte and back up again. Anions, because they are negative ions, so they are able to provide electrons to the positive electrode. So the positive electrode actually strips away that electron for them. And so in that case, the anions, as they flow towards the anode, become oxidized. The cations are positive, so they can accept electrons. And so that's why we have a negative electrode at the cathode, so they can accept the electron and they themselves can be reduced. So if you look at the two equations down there, um, the A anions, we see that um, it is being oxidized and the cations um, of M is also being reduced. Here, what we see that's different from voltaic is that do you see that the anions and the cations, their final product, they're both elemental forms of their ions. So the cation of M becomes the elemental form of M and the anion of A becomes the um, elemental form of A. So what doesn't change? Voltaic and electrolytic, electrons still flow from anode to cathode. Oxidation always occurs at the anode and reduction always occurs at the cathode. The only difference is that for the anode, the um, electrodes, positive and negative, they're swapped around. Um, and the cathodes are also, the electrode um, is positive and voltaic and negative and electrolytic. Let's take a look, compare one more time. Voltaic cells generate electrical energy. So that's why we have the voltmeter there to measure it. Um, electrolytic is non-spontaneous, so it doesn't generate electricity. It needs electricity to run their redox reactions. So because of that, um, we supply it with a DC circuit, and that's why the DC circuit is shown by the long and the short line connecting the circuit. Um, electricity, electrons always flow from the positive to the negative 
um, of the battery, positive being the longer line and the negative being the shorter of the two lines. Some changes due to redox, some color changes, um, gaseous products being produced. Also, there might be a pH change. There may also be a color change. So these are all different changes that indicate um, whether or not a redox reaction has occurred. Let's take a look at this. What electrical chemical cell is this? This is a Xiaomi battery pack. So I'm sure a lot of you use battery packs to recharge your phones when they run out of battery. Is this battery pack a voltaic cell or is this an electrolytic cell? Um, let's have you guys take a couple moments to think about that. So like some of you may or may not have thought about, this battery pack is actually both a voltaic and an electrolytic. It's a voltaic when you're charging your phone. When your phone is running out of battery, you need more electrical energy. So the battery pack supports that electrical energy for you, right? So the battery pack converts the chemical energy that it has stored in the battery pack into electrical energy for you to charge your phone. But when the battery pack runs out of battery, even if you plug it into your phone, it doesn't work anymore. And so you need to recharge that battery. So any rechargeable battery, like a phone recharger, um, you would need to plug that back into some outlet to recharge your battery pack. In order for that to happen, then we know that that's an electrolytic cell, right? Because as we plug it into an outlet, we're supplying our battery pack with more electricity, with more electrical energy. That electrical energy is going to flow from the outlet into your battery pack and convert into chemical energy. So that electrical energy is supplied as an external source to produce, to generate chemical energy, which then you can use when you charge your own phone when your battery pack is fully charged. So that is how the battery pack works. 